Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Daily Thread. My father is back over there in Florida. Well, these are these are these are uh, I don't know. These are two places that uh, that uh, I think uh, our people uh, populate. Uh, Israel and, uh, right. and parts of Florida. Uh, I, I, that's it. It's just Israel and Florida. That's, I don't know. That's sort of been the. Not, not sort of been. I don't. I don't want to be presumptuous. A lot of people, a high percentage of people, don't budge. You know. So I'm being presumptuous if I say people go to Israel once or twice a year. People go to Florida, you know, three or four times a year. That's very presumptuous. You know, it's almost like when yeah. we talk about last week we talked about Pesach hotels, and you know I've written about Pesach hotels extensively over the years. But it, it occurred. I didn't. It didn't shock me. But it occurred to me uh, that um, that uh, the truth of the matter is probably ninety five percent of our people, uh, observant Jews, don't go to Pesach hotels. First of all, it's a lot of money. Number one. Okay. Yeah, it and, is. And uh, even staying home is a lot of money on Pesach. That, that's something that we hear about uh, every every year about the high cost of of food around Pesach. It doesn't stop the amount of the price of the food from going up, but at least we get to talk about it. Um, yeah, I guess so. I, I I guess I agree with that number. At the end of the day, I mean, there's most people are making Pesach at home. Um, we try. And I we, think uh, you know we have a Bar Hashem, uh, a lot of advertisers <laughs> doing Pesach in hotels and in Orlando, and in Mexico are back this year. Um, we used to have, I don't know, one of the biggest Pesach hotel sections in the in the Anglo-Jewish media. It's a small, it's smaller now because there's less programs, I believe. Uh, and people also have their loyal um, their loyal customers that come back year after year, so they don't have to they don't have to cast such a a, a wide net. But I spoke to one of the guys. I'm not going to say which hotel, of course. I spoke to one of the guys last week. I said, by the way, how much are you charging for a room this year? And he gave me an astronomical price. I said, how can you charge that for a room? He says, inflation. There's inflation. There's inflation. Yeah, so, so that's the answer to everything. If you want to go away and pay stuff this year, it's going to cost you more money than usual. You know why? There's inflation. <laughs> yeah. So last night um, I was by the Haas concert. And it was incredible, as usual. It's the biggest stage in, in Jewish music. Uh, a lot of great performers and artists. And you know, thousands of people there. They really up their they up the level of on how they do things. Yeah, you know, it's really it's almost like it's almost like a dinner plus a concert. You know, they really they, they put out a nice spread and it's really, really beautiful. And I spoke to a lot of the performers before they went on stage and and I was I was shocked how like how chilled, relaxed and calm almost all of them were. And the, none of them are, are nervous. They've been doing this, doing this for such a long time, whether it's Shalom Lemmer, Akiva Terjima, Yaakov Shwaki, like they're so calm. They're so relaxed. How many performers did they thing, have? How many performers did they have? I think they had, they had seven performers. Seven only? Um, the Miami Boys Choir, Eitan Katz, mm-hmm. uh, Shalom Lemmer, Akiva, Itzik Dadia, um, Yitzi Waldner, and they had a mentalist. So the big name. Had a too. So the big name was uh, Yaakov Shweki. It sounds to me <clears throat> like Yaakov Shweki and Akiva. Shum Lama. And Akiva. Akiva. Akiva was a really. He, he was amazing. Really? Everyone really loved him. Was the, where was the concert in uh, in Lincoln? It was Atlanta? in the NJ Pack. Yeah, where? it was in New Jersey. Oh really? In the Performing Arts Center. Yeah, uh-huh. it, was, it didn't take too. It didn't take too long to get there. It was very nice. Um, it was really incredible. Hask is they doing great things. I, I had the opportunity to speak to. To Rabbi Shmuel Khan backstage, his father started Hask in 1963, I believe. Wow! And he, his father, they didn't have any special needs children, but he was, you know, he was advised by his Rebbe. He said, "Hey, listen, this is a need," and he started Hask. And um, I think the first summer he said they had 20, 23 campers or 32 campers, and now obviously it grew into something way bigger than that. You know, they have. They're now building a hospital within their camp even to just keep up with what they're doing. They're rebuilding bunks. Um, but it, it's really incredible. And and as I was speaking to him, he, he remarked that it's the yard site of his father mm-hmm. last night. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering if like that generally happens, yeah. if the Haas concert usually coincides. And it says it happens. Listen, it's doing the 36 years. It happens once in a while. So 
it was it was really nice. Um, a lot of people there. It's an incredible thing, and yeah, you think back over the years, and uh, there've always been um, you know children with various uh, challenges that were born for any combination of reason, the genetics, um, the environment. Uh, you know, we have an ad running in the paper now. Darius Sharm is testing for, you know, hearing loss. Yeah, genetic hearing loss. Genetic hearing loss. You know, so uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of issues. There's a lot of issues, yeah. but it required people like uh, the senior Mr. Khan to have a, to have a, a vision of uh, how. And the most important thing is, you know, most societies in in the world don't have this type of respectable, dignified environment from which their um, young people or even older people um, can can live with uh, with dignity. Yeah, when I, and be taken when I was care when of. I was when I was there this summer in Hask, they uh, they had a birthday party for their oldest camper, who was, I believe, was sixty five years old. Yeah, you know, I I think I I think uh, I heard uh, that uh, there's a, a gentleman living in uh, one of the base Ezra Ohel houses that's in his nineties. You know, really, yeah, that's what I heard. It's incredible when you speak to David Mandel when you when you interview. Him, yeah, it's coming up in the next few weeks. You could ask, yeah. you could ask him about that, but uh, you know, for sure, that this is this is uh, what a civilized this is how a civilized society should function, and, and it's really an, an, an example for the world. And there's many examples. I don't want to leave anybody out, whether it's High Lifeline, or Camp Simcha, or Hask, or this is just one of them. Yeah, you know, you know, it, it, it's 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 such a beautiful thing. And and, um, and it's such a beautiful thing that, you know, the government subsidizes most of this uh, so that everybody could could uh, could benefit from it. You know, um, yeah, actually, I saw a movie. They, I, mean, I saw a movie about it um, on 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 uh, high flicks an Israeli uh, movie channel, which has some very nice uh, films about Israel. Um, it's called Shoelaces. It's about a developmentally uh, challenged young man who's living with his mother. His parents are divorced, and his mother passes away, and his father doesn't want him. Uh, but he ends up reluctantly taking him. And, you know, it's just uh, I started watching it on the plane yesterday coming down here uh, on my mm -hmm. iPad. And um, I finished uh, seeing it last night uh, after my riff and before dinner, <laughs> unless you want to know my schedule. And, um, it's uh, it's a tearjerker, uh, but it's very real. It's it's very real, and uh, if you have time and you want to see something that really will leave an impression on you for for life, it's called Shoelaces, and it's on uh, High Flicks. It's uh, it's a it's a great uh, I should add clean uh, thing with a great uh, a great moral lesson. It stars Dan Glickman. You know Dan. You know who Dan Glickman is. I do not. He plays Shulam Stissel. And Stissel. Oh, you know Shul. You know, know you know Shulam Stissel. <sighs> Rings a bell. Who doesn't know Shulam Stissel? Let's get to the first story for today. The first story today, uh, via YWN, is uh, the title: "Shocking: Jewish Man Injured in an Intentional Ramming Attack in Crown Heights." A Jewish a Jewish man was rammed and injured by a vehicle in Crown Heights on Friday evening in an incident that the NYPD is now investigating as a biased attack. The disturbing incident unfolded around 6 p.m. at the intersection of Albany Avenue and Union Street in Crown Heights when the driver of a white sedan stopped at a red light, appeared to notice a visibly Jewish man crossing the street. The surveillance video shows the driver appeared to intentionally turn and ram his vehicle into the Jewish man before accelerating and fleeing the scene. Uh, the, the man who is um, in his 50s was treated by Atsala yeah. and was taken to the hospital for yeah. the treatment. Albany, so, Albany, uh, Albany Avenue and where? Albany and Union Street. Albany and Union Street. Okay, I know I know Crown Heights fairly well. I'm trying to, so, I'm trying to picture Albany um, and Union. I, okay. I'm not. I'm not going to show the video. I'm not going to show the video because it's it's pretty disturbing, and you know I don't think people need to see this unless you know you're going to go out there and try to find the guy. So I know that it says here that Yeshiva World showed the video, um, ho hoping that it could expedite the apprehension of the suspect, and maybe it will. Maybe someone will recognize the car. But ultimately, what, what the video shows is his car making a left turn, a man crossing the street. The car maybe you know slowed down a bit and then and then accelerated and hit and hit the man and the man fell. Um, I did see a tweet. I did see a tweet online, um, and I want to pull it up about somebody. Bear with me. Yeah. 
I mean, like, I, I'm not, you know what? I'm the first one to say if this was a, a hate crime that we need to, we need to apprehend this person. Regardless, we have to apprehend this person. They, they left the scene of an accident. That's, that's a hit and run. Right. Um, but what, if it wasn't a hate crime, like it, it maybe it could have been just a your typical hit and run. Like it could have been, I, I don't it, know. It could have been a, could have, it could have been a lot of things. You know, I, I don't know. Did the police conclude that it was a hate crime? I, I know they, nobody, they're wa- investigating yeah, it. They're, they're reluctant to do that. Um, there's a, there, there's a tweet here from Yako Berman, yeah. um, who his position is he's the director of OPS survival and he's the public relations at Chabad Lubavitch headquarters. Okay. Um, and he tweeted uh, yesterday about the hit and run video. NYPD is being responsible in investigating all possibilities. It appears from the video that driver may have intentionally driven into the victim, but we simply don't know yet for certain. Either way, jumping to conclusions is irresponsible. Um, well, first of all, you know, which, uh, first of all, if everything is going to every time uh, uh, something like this happens, it's going to be labeled a hate crime. Reflexively, we're going to get used to hearing about hate crimes. That's not going to have the impact. That it should have when it's a genuine uh, hate crime. Now, I, I saw the video too. I, I, I would hope that the objective of watching the video is to get the Lear and make it a car, uh, maybe a picture of the driver, maybe a, uh, a photo of the of the license plate as a way to uh, to track the person down. But I'm glad to hear the victim is uh, is okay. Um, but like you said to me earlier, I mean, the guy was about to hit the car that was parked. I mean. He, wa- yeah. he wanted to get this guy maybe, so maybe, bad that he was willing to, uh, you know, uh, do damage well, to another car. Well, yeah. Well, what person? I mean, yeah. Like, why would he? He's not intentionally trying to hit a car. Well, I'm not making. It, it, it was it. It was a really weird turn. Like, it wasn't. It maybe maybe it was a drunk driver. I, yeah, I don't know. You know. I mean, it's I, very. I'm not making this. It's very uncommon. Not, it's very uncommon to hear of car rammings in, in the states. Yeah, like, we don't really hear. Yeah, that. I'm not making. I'm not making. First of all, you're right. I'm not making excuses for the for the for the driver. We don't know who he is, but more likely, statistically, it's probably a drunk driver, considering how he was driving, and uh, probably a stolen car. On top of that, probably an unlicensed driver or a guy whose license has been suspended 18 times. A lot, a lot of assumptions. Why are you assuming it's a stolen car? No, I'm not saying. I'm not assuming. I'm, this this happens more common than hate crimes. Is that is that so? Yes, it's so. Look it up. <laughs> okay. I don't, I'll look I don't know up. where you can look it up, but the number of hate crimes, I don't know how many hate crimes there are. I mean, you know, it, 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 there's more than there should be. One is too many, uh, but there's yeah. more con- drunk driving and uh, driving without a license and uh, reckless uh, driving is more common than uh, than any, any of those uh, uh, other things we were talking about. Uh, I don't know if you saw, do you see the video of the guy that walked into a restaurant in Houston? And, yeah. and held up and, yeah. and held up all the people that were sitting at the tables and everybody took money out of their pockets and uh, and threw money on what the floor you? and the guy picked it up and then when he turned his back one of the patrons the guy's in Texas and Texas everyone's walking around with guns I think the guy turned yeah. the guy turned his back to pick up some money and 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 one of the customers sitting at the table took out his own gun and shot the guy yeah. nine times and killed him nine times yeah Oh, I thought I I I thought it was only once. Whatever. I, again, like I try not to watch these videos because it's like really no, desensitizes. I, I, I'll tell you the truth. They, you know what? I was looking for the video online. No one that I I couldn't find the actual video online, but you could you could hear the audio. That's why you can hear the shots being fired. You know, so crazy. So and well, listen. And it I mean, turns out the guy was that's... the guy was carrying a fake. The, the the robber was carrying a fake gun. So so maybe this patron of the restaurant is kind of going to jail for murder. Well. <laughs> As of yesterday, they didn't find the patron yet, although they have a picture of him. They say. What do you mean? The, one second. The patron left. Yeah, the patron. The patron left. Yeah. Oh, he shot him and left. Yeah, as of yesterday. Oh, you. I didn't, you probably should stick around. As of yesterday. You probably should stick. Around. I don't know. Maybe, may, maybe he panicked. You know, not everybody. Yeah, that's not a good move. Not everybody that's a gun owner walks around shooting people. You know. I know, but if you're going to do that, then you're a hero. I mean, a guy came into a restaurant with a gun. You're a hero. Speaking of hate crimes, uh, there's a, a story here via JNS. Ben Gvir orders police to enforce a ban on flying Palestinian flags in solidarity with terrorists. Okay. Ben Gvir vows to fight terrorism and the encouragement of terrorism with all our might, which is might seem like a small order from Ben Gvir, but, it, but you know, 
there's nothing worse. I mean, there probably are things worse, but it's it's never nice seeing you know after a terrorist attack is committed and you see the Palestinians flying their their nationalistic colors. Like this is something to be proud of. So, um, which which police force is gonna like what a band does? Maybe in the book that like th- was it legal? I feel <laughs> was it legal before? Like if someone commits a terrorist attack, it's legal to fly the Palestinian flag. Like I think once someone commits a terrorist attack, all bets are off. Nothing beyond that is legal. No, it's an interesting ban to make. Well, it's a it's a small step. It doesn't mean that much. It's a small step. It might be. I don't know if it's a step. It might be like a little like a toe tap. Uh, maybe it's a toe tap. But there's more important things that happened over the weekend. Uh, number one, uh, they um, um, not Ben Gvir, but Batal Smorich who is uh, in charge of the uh, finance, finance ministry. Uh, first of all, you know, um, in an agreement with Israel going back over 30 years, uh, about about 30 years to the Oslo Accords, uh, they, um, uh, the Israeli government collects uh, taxes uh, for the Palestinian Authority, uh, for business that's, uh, that's uh, done in, in, you know, in the Palestinian Authority, because the Palestinians don't have the infrastructure to withhold tax and, and uh, do whatever has to be done with tax money. Anyway, they have the infrastructure to fund terrorism, but they don't have the infrastructure right, to hold taxes. Right, right. So anyway, maybe maybe it's something that Israel insists on as a way of controlling the money. Anyway, Israel has consistently yeah. transferred hundreds of millions of dollars to the Palestinian Authority, regardless of what's been going on for many, many, uh, many years, because they don't want they, they want to keep good order. And as long as you keep feeding, you know. You know, if you if you if you come face to face with a lion, chances are if you have a couple of steaks in your pocket and you throw it at him, he's going to eat the steaks, not come after you. Yeah. So they keep throwing uh, they keep throwing money uh, um, after them. But uh, this weekend, uh, they signed uh, 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 they created a policy where where two things: number one, they're withholding that tax money now, and they're deducting from that money two things. Number one, up to this point, if someone um, injures or kills a Jew in a terrorist attack and he gets imprisoned, the Palestinian Authority um, supports that family financially for life, okay? So right. in other words, there's an incentive to commit these types of uh, murderous, um, violent uh, acts. So, But now yeah. you would think that they would withhold the money. You would think they would have done it 25 years ago. But no, there's a great debate and a great tug of war about whether to withhold the money or not. But anyway, now the new Netanyahu government is uh, is withholding uh, that money, and uh, in addition to that, there is uh, uh, a case called uh, it's called the Litvak case. Uh, it has to do with a family <laughs> named Litvak. Nothing to do with Litvak. Oh, okay. Nothing to do with Litvak. I was getting to, I was getting I was getting excited. Happens to be it happens to be the family name in which the Israeli courts decided that there's a group of uh, families that were victimized by Palestinian terror injuries, deaths in families, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they were rewarded by the courts about uh, $40 million, but they were never paid because all the money gets passed from the Israeli tax collectors back to the Palestinian government, which uses a good deal of the money to reward families who has a family member who committed a terrorist act. Anyway, now uh, uh, Mr. Smorich in his role as finance minister has decided to take forty million dollars and distribute it uh, to those families who won their case. Uh, I think it goes back to two thousand and nine. So mm-hmm. this should have happened a long time ago, but uh, you know, Baruch Hashem, it's it, it, it's happening now. These are not radical or extreme things. These are right things. That that, that num- number one, these people should be compensated for the pain that they suffered. Number one, and number two, you accomplish a great deal. By withholding the money from people that misuse it, hundred percent. I, I, I think I think they should withhold the money regardless. I think it's silly of the Palestinian Authority to like to expect Israel to hold their taxes for them and then give it to them, considering any any act of violence happening. But, um, but that's a, that's how Israel works. Is you know you know how Israelis are. It's their money. Yeah. It, well, second, we're collecting it for them. It's their money. Oh, but what about terrorism? Yeah, but how come, no, no, no. Don't talk to me about terrorism. It's their money. Well, how, how, how come the Israeli cab drivers are not the same? Like, <laughs> no, they have no problem. They have no problem charging me 500 shekel to go from Tel Aviv to Yushalayim if I'm American. 
Maybe no. maybe the maybe we maybe we should get some cab drivers in the Knesset. They know how to hold on to money. No, first of all, I, I've said I think I've said it here in the past, and I've uh, realized this many many years ago. Um, you can't you can't overpay in a in a um, in a uh, Israeli taxi. You, no matter what you no matter what you give them, um, you know once you pay the fare, if you're paying something over the fare, it automatically becomes stucker. So you're you're giving charity. That that that's what it becomes. Says who? Why? So I say that's what I say. I, I was oh, in, so you, I, you, I was you, in, I was in, you you Paskin. I was in, yeah. I was in a taxi. I was in a taxi, and uh, uh, you know the, it said fifty. It said fifty shekel on the meter. Okay. So I gave. I only had a hundred shekel bill. So I gave the driver a hundred shekel. Whatever, you're a gavir. You're a, you're a gavir. No, nothing to do with the gavir. It was a it was a hundred shekel. I have a lot of stories about these uh, taxi fares. Uh, it was a hundred shekel, and uh, he guy gave me back twenty five shekel change. What am I going to say? Give me another twenty five shekel. Listen, he's an Israeli driver. He's a yeah, Jewish he's pl- driver. yeah, he's play. He's playing you. You're American. Matthew, he's playing he you. Need, he needed if he needed the twenty five shekel. He needed the twenty five shekel. I was happy to give it to him. You know, the guys walking around. You know, there's people that I've seen by the hotel collecting money for the last uh, forty years. Okay, there's one guy that I always see. And I always give him a couple of bucks, you know, some of the shliach mitzvah money that I bring with me, you know. So I saw him the first day a few weeks ago that I was in Jerusalem going to Davin in the morning at the hotel, and I gave him $10, okay, 10 American dollars. Okay, not a great deal of money. Okay, anyway, I saw him the next day, and he put his hand out against me. He said, shliach mitzvah. I said to him, I gave you money yesterday. He says, oh, did you eat yesterday? <laughs> huh. Really? Yeah. So he, he got me, you know. He got you. He, he got, he got you. me. I, I was like a little stunned, <clears throat> and uh, I, I, I'm always going to remember that. Okay. So I should come when you get back. I should put my hand out <sighs> to you every day. Oh, you, when did you stop doing that? <laughs> <laughs> did I miss? Did I miss something? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very, very good. Okay, that's that's really that's a really nice story. Um, they, these Israeli, they they have they have the wit. Uh, they would be incredible businessmen, you know, if they well, were they to want to go they're, down that field. That's why Israel Israel is like the fourth the, the fourth uh, largest largest uh, uh, has the greatest presence on the uh, on the on the Nasdaq, for example. Uh, they're very high up in the types of innovations, technological inventions. My goodness, there are 200 countries mm-hmm. in the world, and Israel's number number four. You know, after the United States, and maybe really? after England, maybe after one or two other countries. But of course, they right. have that 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 koach, that that tremendous ability. Anyway, what else? I want to give there? a big shout out, a big mazel tov to Yossi Hacht, Yossi Hacht, um, who many of you know. Uh-huh. From yes, yes. music video with Hoppin' Freed, right. he's rolling around the five towns doing his thing. He got engaged really last nice. week. His vart, his vart was yesterday. Oh, yeah, his vart was in the white shul. Um, beautiful. He got engaged to a girl from. He got engaged to a girl from Los Angeles. I believe her name is Sasha Frankel. Beautiful. I think. I hope I got that right. And yeah, it's beautiful to see. It's beautiful to see. Um, Baruch Hashem. So big miles tough to him. He had. A star-studded Vart, Ravelia Burdney showed up, Rabbi Bender showed up, Ravel Tiske showed up. He had a lot of people there, and it's beautiful to see uh, Simchas. And that's uh, what we should continue to see is more Simchas, more Simchas. Yeah, I know. Of course. Um, okay, so listen, we there's this is just the beginning of the week. Um, the first week in – the second – we're heading to the second week of January 2023. So let me, I, uh, let me just finish up by telling you something about um, – you know, we, we had a, like an 11 o'clock flight down here yesterday, so we got to the airport around 9.30. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and uh, we, we flew down here, Baruch Hashem, uh, very quickly, two hours, 20 minutes, very smoothly. Then you land, and the, and the pilot announces that we landed early. But that's 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 not just that's not only good news when you when you land early. Then they tell you, oh, you know, there's somebody in, the, in our space. <laughs> so we got to wait. We gotta wait till the, the plane before us yeah. clears out, and then we get. So it's twenty minutes. So so much for uh, flying yeah, down here real fast. Anyway, we finally got a car. We got here, and it reminded me of um, a great chassid, Reb Mendel Futafas, Zechus uh, Sadik Levracha, who was arrested by the Soviets uh, for teaching Torah underground in the olden days, and they arrested him because he was teaching. 
and they put him on a train to Siberia and they blindfolded him. And he was on a train for 36 hours until uh, he was telling a story when he finally got out of Russia and he came to America and he settled in Crown Heights. And they said to him, Reb Mendel, you're on the train 36 hours with a blindfold on. And when you finally got there and the train stopped and they took the blindfold off, what were you thinking? He says, I'll tell you, I looked outside and it looked like it was time for Mincha. So I died in Mincha. <laughs> so <laughs> when I got here yesterday, it was like a half hour before Mincha. So I looked at my schedule. It reminded you of that. <laughs> no, I wasn't on a train to Siberia exactly. It wasn't yeah. the same thing. Was on. Did you did did you did you fly Spirit Airlines? <laughs> no, like <laughs> no, I we we flew we flew Delta Baruch Hashem. And uh, but when I got here, it was about a half hour before Mincha. So I got ready to dive in Mincha. Amazing. Well, that's our episode for today. Make sure to subscribe to the Daily Thread on WhatsApp status. We got another episode coming right your way tomorrow, okay. so stay tuned. Day, Hit the subscribe button on Apple and Spotify, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye.